When I went into physics in the 1990s, everyone thought we're about to discover a theory of everything. I too believe that. But today, not only do I not believe we're about to discover it, I think such a theory doesn't exist. There's a simple reason physicists thought we're close to reaching a theory of everything. It's that nature seems to have a fundamental limit to how well we can resolve small structures. Beyond that limit, the universe is is inevitably blurry, or so it seems. This shortest length scale is about 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's called the Planck scale, named after Max Planck. It seems to set a limit to how precisely we can probe structures. And all that's before that we already know. This is why physicists thought that the next theory we'll find in physics will be the last one. It'll be a theory that explains this blurriness. It comes from the way that quantum physics combines with gravity, or so they believe. Remember that according to Einstein, gravity is caused by the curvature of space and time. He taught us that space and time are dynamic and respond to masses and energy in them. Also remember that according to quantum mechanics, masses and energies have no exact location because of the uncertainty principle. If you combine these two properties, it implies that the quantum uncertainty of masses leads to an uncertainty in space. And that means that locations themselves become uncertain. Not just the location of a particle, but what it means for something to even have a location. This is the fundamental limit to resolution. The general argument dates back to Matvei Bronstein in the 1930s. In case you've never heard of him, it's probably because his career was very short. In 1938, when he was just about 31 years old, he was executed in a Leningrad prison. For the next 40 years, no one paid much attention to his ideas, or maybe they were too scared. But then in the 1970s, the question returned. It returned because by then, physicists had completed the rest of the foundations of physics besides gravity. They had collected all particles in the standard model and figured out that they hold together by merely three interactions, the electromagnetic and the strong and weak nuclear interactions. These three have quantum properties, but they still hadn't succeeded in combining these three interactions with gravity. They had, however, given a name to the theory they were trying to find quantum gravity. We still don't know what the correct theory for quantum gravity is, but we have several approaches. And would you know it, this resolution limit that Bronstein was already going on about has crept up in almost all of them. Be that string theory or loop quantum gravity or asymptotically safe gravity, all of them seem to say that the universe limits how much we can learn about it. Then again, maybe that shouldn't surprise us, because the major problem that these theories of quantum gravity should solve is singularities, points in space where the curvature can become infinitely large. In Einstein's theories, this happens inside of black holes or at the Big Bang. In these singularities, the mathematics breaks down. We can't calculate what happened before the Big Bang or after a black hole singularity. And a simple way to get rid of these singularities is to blur them out. This is what quantum gravity does. It blurs out what happens on short distance scales. By the way, this video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. You can now also use AI to create your own quizzes on my website. But when physicists speak of a theory of everything, they mean more than just a quantization of gravity that makes Einstein's theories fit together with the standard model. They also want all the details of the standard model itself to come out of it, like the masses and the types of interactions and the strengths of the interactions. It should all come from one unified idea, like strings, for example, or Gerrit Lisi's E8, or Eric Weinstein's geometric unity, or Stephen Wolfram's hypergraphs. That is what they mean by a theory of everything. There are some good reasons to believe in such a theory of everything, and some not-so-good reasons. 
the not so good reasons are aesthetic. It'd be prettier if we had one theory for everything rather than several different ones, and certainly nature must be pretty. This is the same argument that astronomers made to say that the planetary orbits are certainly circles, and that didn't work so well either. Generally, aesthetic arguments have historically worked badly, which is to say there is no evidence they work any better than random chance. After the arguments from beauty, there are some suspicions that everyone has about the standard model. If you just look at the masses of the particles, they don't look random. They seem to have a pattern in which the particles in three generations have masses that are about an order of magnitude apart. And the only particles that use only the weak interaction, the neutrinos, have the smallest masses. There is something going on there that we don't understand. It doesn't seem likely that this would be a coincidence. Then again, one can only talk about the likelihood of something occurring if one has a probability distribution. We only ever observe this one universe, so how are we supposed to know whether it's likely or unlikely what we observe? I made this argument in my book Lost in Math, but I don't think physicists understood it. A somewhat better reason to believe in a theory of everything is that gravity and the standard model, despite all their differences, do have a lot in common. They're both failed theories. They both heavily rely on symmetries. They both can be described in terms of curvature. A lot of people more intelligent than me have tried to use these similarities to formulate a theory of everything, and so far they've not been successful. And over the years I've come to think that the reason that none of these approaches to a theory of everything led anywhere is that there is no such theory. There's no such theory because the argument for its existence is circular. It's logically wrong. You see, the argument is that this theory would be a final theory because it has this resolution limit. But the only support for this is the resolution limit that we find in approaches to quantum gravity, which assumes that this theory is a final theory. So if you assume it's a final theory, then it's a final theory. To use a technical term, these approaches all assume that a theory of everything is UV finite. If you don't make that assumption, you have no idea what happens at short distances, so you don't know whether it's a theory of everything. And without that argument, the only reason we have to think that we're close to a final theory of everything is that we don't have much left to explain. Quantize gravity, throw in a few extra particles for dark matter, done. Also, you could think, if you ignore, like almost all physicists, that we don't understand quantum physics in the first place. This is why I believe that working on a theory of everything is a waste of time. We first need to understand what's going on in a measurement in quantum mechanics. Of course, most physicists think I'm as crazy as I think they are, and there's a nice symmetry in that. You could almost say it's beautiful. If this video inspired you to get started on your own theory of everything or somewhat more modestly to brush up your physics knowledge, I suggest you check out Brilliant. They have high quality courses that can help you get started on any level. Brilliant.org offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Some even have executable Python scripts or videos with a little demonstration experiments. Whether you want to know more about large language models or quantum computer Computing, want to learn coding in Python or know how computer memory works, Brilliant has you covered. And they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. 
And of course, I have a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabina, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. It's an easy way to learn more and to support this channel. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.